If you've been told to pull up your socks recently, then make sure it's a pair of RCR socks. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash shop. One of my favorite interviews I've ever done was with Simon O'Connor. When it was revealed that the Chinese government had been spying on him, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to get him back on to talk about that and a few other things. Simon's on the line now, so let's have a conversation. Simon O'Connor, welcome back to The Crunch and welcome back to Reality Check Radio being back on air. And thank you for your support uh, on social media during our hiatus, as I like to call it. Well, great to rejoin you, Cam. I must say I got lots of lovely feedback about your interview. But again, congratulations to you and the wider team for getting back on air. I know there are a lot of Kiwis and actually people overseas too looking forward to hearing your shows again. Yeah, I got a lovely email from a fan who listens in Japan. He's a car buyer and he sits in the auctions buying cars to come into New Zealand you know, on a Saturday, and he said he, he listens to the replays of The Crunch every Saturday while he's buying cars, which was kind of nice of him to say that. That's fantastic. Maybe if he's listening, he could uh, could buy you a really nice car as sort of a, a thank you <laughs> for the work that you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of, you know, uh, limousine type one, and then I just need to get a driver to cruise me around, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm on the back of buses, so. Then... <laughs> oh, good. Very good. That's well, something I should aspire to. That's right. Now, uh, th- a couple of weeks ago, um, you were in the news uh, inadvertently uh, as it's been revealed that you have been spied on. Who have you been spied on by? Well, the name of the group's APT, um, Advanced Persistent Threat 31, but it's a, it's a state-sponsored or a Chinese government state-sponsored uh, group. Um, you may have heard of other ones, APT 40. Sorry, give me a second to clear my throat. Sorry, not getting emotional. Um, yeah, just being <laughs> just in case your listeners go, oh, he's lost his voice. Yeah, so it's a, a Chinese backed, Chinese state backed hacking group, Advanced Persistent Threat Thirty One. They targeted uh, members of what's called IPAC, the Interparliamentary uh, Alliance on China. Mm. And there's three of us in New Zealand. There's Louisa Wall. You'll remember her as the Labour yes. MP. Yes. Uh, myself uh, and Professor Anne Marie Brady who deals a lot with China issues based out of Canterbury uh, University. So they targeted us, but important for your listeners to understand, they targeted members of IPAC um, across the globe. Right. So Australia, UK, Canada, you name it. So it's global spying by by the Chinese government, essentially. Yeah, it was a low-level attack. That doesn't take away from its seriousness. Yeah. Um, What they did was sent out emails, uh, which actually, Cam, had human rights themes to them. Right. And why I mentioned that is that's particularly attractive to people in, in IPAC. We're often speaking about human rights. So think of Uyghurs, Falun Gong, the Tibetans, House Christians, and others. Um, so it was, it was a, a lure, and in the email uh, was a picture, and inside that picture or image was one pixel. Um, mm. And that pixel was able to, if loaded, uh, which it normally does when you open an email, yeah. uh, sent back information to the hackers about your IP address, what browser you're using, location, and so forth. So it's known as pixel reconnaissance. So it's, it's kind of a phishing email, wasn't it? They were hoodwinking you into thinking it was something you'd be interested in, so you'd open the email. You open the email, and then it's all over after that. Yeah, to a degree it, it was. It's one of those things, certainly I was an MP at the time, you get so many emails from so many different people around the world. It's not unusual uh, to open an email. To be honest, this was back in 2021. I should have noted that. That was January 2021. So I honestly can't remember if I opened it or not. But really important too for listeners to understand, there were no links, there were no macros. It wasn't as if uh, you know we blundered and opened a Microsoft document, just merely opening the email, loaded one little pixel, and off it went. So I actually still have uh, the email. Uh, well, well, quarantine now, but I was able to search my old files and uh, found it. So uh, quite disturbing, and, and it, it's just not on. It, when a lot of people can talk about our trade, understandably, with China and our independent foreign policy, and let's not annoy China, well, maybe the Chinese Communist Party could stop trying to infiltrate email accounts of members of parliament and academics. And, political, nice. and political parties. Oh, yeah. Look, this is... <laughs> This is ongoing, by the way. I mean, oh, we yeah. shouldn't be. They never yeah. stop. 
they never they're like rust it never they never sleep i remember when uh, my father was the president of of the national party and before that when he was the auckland regional chair of the national party and he would regularly get phone calls from the chinese consul in auckland or or the ambassador to tell him to tell government ministers they needed to pull their head in over Taiwan or um, anything like that. And it was interesting to see that as a kid, the way that dad responded to those things. He would say to them, well, thank you for your comment, but we live in a democracy and people are entitled to their point of view, even if you don't like it. Thank you, good day, and hang up. (laughs) I like your dad. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, and I remember too, uh, MPs would go to the National Day for Taiwan and they would wear their KMT pins and go to those sorts of functions. But that changed under John Key and it changed significantly where MPs, as I understand it, were told not to go to the Taiwanese National Day, even though they might have been going for every year for 20 years not to mention Taiwan, and to be completely uh, almost sycophantic to Chinese interests. And I thought to myself, is this the same party where my dad was the president and used to hang up on the Chinese ambassador and tell them to go fly a kite? You know, it's changed that much, and it was only in the space of about 10 or 15 years that it changed. Yeah, it doesn't take long in political parties for change to occur in a whole lot of different ways. I suppose, you know, different MPs have have different views. I think it would be fair to say there's a number in the current National Party and certainly uh, in the years that I was in Parliament studying with the John Key government that it was much more pro-trade, pro-China. Um, I personally don't remember any instructions to, to not attend, but as someone who's a great supporter of uh, Taiwan would turn up to their if you will, Independence Day celebrations, yep. would one of the only MPs actually, in fact, the only MP uh, who would turn up to the Tiananmen Square uh, memorials that they used to hold on Simon Street and other things. So he was still able mm. to go, but I, I do know it wasn't well welcomed by some colleagues who, I just call them the pro-trade, if I'm being diplomatic, the pro-trade <laughs> guys, which is very much, trade's important, which it is, do not talk about anything else. Don't, don't stir up on human rights. Don't talk about these, you know, foreign espionage attempts. Just, just not talk about any of it. I obviously disagree. And like your father, I used to get phone calls from the embassy telling me off. And mainly, Cam, they'd be saying, you know, don't, don't comment on internal matters in China. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. They're welcome to have that opinion. But I would always end uh, reminding them that the irony that now, now telling a member of New Zealand's parliament what to do and say in his own country. Uh, so but I hope they got the irony or the paradox or hypocrisy uh, in all of that. I don't think they do. I don't think they care. I mean, I've watched, because I've got an interest in Fiji, of course, being born there, uh, watching the Chinese move in to Fiji and into Fijian society in ways that are alarming. You know, like you'd see some development opportunities happen. And and again, it was all on the basis of trade. The Fijian government would say, this is fantastic. We've got Chinese investment. Um, We're going to build a new cement works to break break the monopoly of the existing cement works. It sounds fine on the surface until you see how they actually do it. There's not a Fijian worker in sight. Then the building of of the cement works, no Fijians were employed. They're all Chinese. Mm -hmm. The Chinese companies that come in to do the roading bring in uh, workers uh, from China to do it all. In the massive high-rise building that was being built in Suva, that towers over Suva, it's built on a hill as well, so it makes it even look larger. It's a statement of Chinese power, uh, mm-hmm. even though it's it's purportedly a, you know, a private interest. But as you know, and I know, and anyone who's got half a brain knows, there are no private interests in China. Uh, there might be billionaires that own these companies, but they own those companies in conjunction and with the support of the CCP. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. And well, so you're seeing this um, soft power being exerted by China in places like Fiji, uh, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, and various other Pacific nations, because what the Chinese are doing is building infrastructure that's going to support them and their trade, and ultimately their military, should they ever need to um, to use those things. 
And what people just fail to understand in New Zealand and Australia will never meet with aid is that the Chinese can outspend us. They, look, they can. And <clears> when I was chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee, so this goes back a, a few years now, I actually initiated an inquiry uh, into foreign aid or New Zealand's aid into the Pacific. And one of the big points of feedback, or actually two points from our Pacific neighbours, was one, they didn't want us telling them uh, what they wanted. You know, a whole bunch of uh, New Zealanders toddling up or Australians, for that matter, telling Fijians and Samoans and Tongans, hey, we think you need this. Their first feedback was, can we please tell you what we think we need and, and then mm. help us? But the second really important part was they know that the likes of China can outspend us, but they actually see us more in a in a relationship. They actually respect the history that we have together. It just particularly whole... particularly for New Zealand, it's not mm. quite the same for Australia. The the particularly in Fiji, they they view Australians with some suspicion. That's true. There are different Pacific Islands have different relationships, but mm. certainly then if we wanted to narrow it to New Zealand, that. In many ways, yep, they want us to come with aid. They're not worried if we don't spend as much. We we have a common history, common values, and sort of a well, a fucker papa for one of a, a better term. And so mm. that they they like that. Um, and so that's the space that we've got to play in, rather than trying to compete with China. And I think the the second thing, and look, you've well touched on it actually. So I'm probably repeating what you've talked about. But yeah, China's game in the Pacific is not just simply trading rivalries. They want to change the rules of the game around how trade and other activities are undertaken. Uh, they do want to control or have greater control over fisheries and sea lanes. And yes, there is a military component. You know, they're pumping money into the Solomon Islands at the moment. There's a reason they're looking towards the Solomon Islands. Anyone who knows their history, and if you like myself, yeah. military history, the Solomons <laughs> is a key area. Now, we shouldn't you know, go nuts, and, but we should be aware of this and do what we can in our interests, our national security and sovereign interests, and that of the Pacific, uh, push back against it. Well, it's like Fiji as well. It's a key strategic location. That's where all of the trans-Pacific cables uh, that provide our internet and phone services and those sorts of things, that's where they all come up in Fiji and then go back down again, obviously. But that is a station uh, for the transmission of important communications infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is why I thought New Zealand was a bit you know, short-sighted in allowing Huawei to supply communications equipment into our telecommunications network. Around the world, many other countries have banned the provision of that core infrastructure by Chinese technology companies. But no, not in New Zealand. We just let it happen. And the same thing's happened in in Fiji as well. So all of that core infrastructure, they don't actually need to control it in New Zealand. They can control it in Fiji. And that's what they are doing. Yeah, look, they're very, they, you've got to give them credit. It's very smart moves. And, you know, some people would say that, you know, it's just great power activities. This is what great powers do. The United Kingdom used to do it, the United States now. And there are some similarities. But at the end of the day, um, I prefer a world system that is primarily dominated by Western values and democracies uh, than a Chinese authoritarian regime. Um, so it's it's a pretty basic choice. So it doesn't mean that everything that we do in New Zealand or in the West is, is good and right, but at the same time, uh, it's much more preferable uh, than to a dictatorship. Yeah, we, we don't have Tiananmen Squares happening in, in democracies by and large, mm. unless it's actually a revolution or some sort of overthrow of a, of a despotic regime. But by and large, people are peaceful, uh, are free to talk about things, uh, as particularly in, you know, in Reality Check Radio, we talk about all sorts of things that are forbidden in other, other media outlets to talk about, but we talk about them because we think it's important that we share those ideas with people. And the Chinese government is against all of that. They want to control the narrative. Uh, they want to control your technology, what's on your handset, who you're communicating with, who you're trading with, who you're paying money to. It's it's a her hermetic environment con completely controlled by the CCP. And I don't think we want that here. And I don't think we want that in the wider world either. 100%. I mean, look at Hong Kong. Um, it, it actually really breaks my heart because it's a wonderful uh, city, mm. a wonderful place. It's quite a vibrant democracy. Uh, it had a, an agreement when Britain handed it back 
uh, for 50 years of a, a relatively free system. Well, the CCP uh, screwed up that treaty uh, and seized control. And the vibrancy of Hong Kong has been removed. There are draconian national security laws now that would put many people in Hong Kong at risk simply talking to you or I. Uh, and I can say that because actually there's a trial going on in Hong Kong at the moment. Jimmy Lai, you, you talked about these million and million mm. and billionaires. He was a Hong Kong businessman, owner of the biggest newspaper, Apple Daily. China just flexed its muscles. They've arrested him, accused him of subversion because he stood for democracy. They've arrested a young guy, uh, Andy Lee, who had uh, very limited involvement with IPAC. Uh, and he's now in prison. They're both in front of the courts uh, because they dared to have an opinion. So it's a very chilling dynamic. And New Zealand shouldn't be naive that we would be any different if, again, the rules of the game were to to change. We just should not take our democracy for granted, nor give moral equivalence to authoritarian regimes. Yeah, and that, that, that's not just China. That's also places like Iran mm. and, and uh, you know sub-Saharan Africa and, oh, and the majority of, majority of the Middle East and Russia, of course. Yep. They're not democracies. They don't respect the rule of law. Um, and at, at a dictator's whim, businesses can be switched off. And that's what concerns me about telecommunications infrastructure. If you're going to conduct a trade war with somebody, what better way to uh, to impinge their ability to trade uh, than switching off their communications or uh, rerouting their communications so you actually get the first view of what everything's going on? And yep. people underestimate the the vast powers of of the CCP and the Chinese government and the reach that they have. Look. A hundred percent. And I think it's one of the things that I've certainly tried to do in my work and my continued writings, certainly with the IPAC work, again, that interparliamentary alliance on China, is particularly to get New Zealanders to understand, because we're a wonderful country, Cam, but I think at times we can be a little bit naive. And uh, there we go. I just put off a pile of your listeners, but we're a bit naive <laughs> um, that we're just this little country at the bottom of the earth. Um, everyone loves us. There would be no problems. Well, no, there are. Uh, and, you know, big autocratic countries like China, like Russia, and Iran, and Kiwis might be surprised to know just how many Iranian operations are conducted down here, foreign interference. Like they it's because are... it's easy for them to do it, yeah. because our, our officials, um, our police, our intelligence uh, services aren't looking at them. Uh, and, uh, and if they are, there's not enough of our intelligence services looking at what's going on. And, and, and I see this all of the time. Um, with you know businesses where all of a sudden there's somebody who's from China comes in uh, invests a bit of money in the business sits inside the business basically stealing intellectual property uh, mm -hmm. which then goes back to China then next minute you're competing with someone who can make something 80% of what you're doing and not particularly well but it's a lot cheaper and so your business just walks out the door mm -hmm. because at some point people like to um you know get a bargain and it's terrible that that happens, but that is what is happening. Yeah, and that that you know buying selling is very much the human human nature. I mean, look, I've got a lot of respect for our intelligence services, but they are stretched. I mean, this is like so many things in New Zealand at the moment. It's a funding issue that there's not enough of them. There's not enough capability. I mean, something as simple as people who can uh, speak Mandarin or Cantonese and get security clearances, we don't have enough. So there's a lot of material that flies around in the likes of uh, WeChat and other fora uh, for people to, uh, well, not so much intercept, but it would be useful for us to understand what's happening. But we just don't have the people and the capacity in this country yet. But this is the exciting, not to go off on a massive tangent, but this is the exciting element of AI and so forth. We're actually using these tools might, might be able to help us in the future. Now, just seeing as we're talking about China, there's been a bit of a, a, a kerfuffle with Winston Peters coming back from overseas and deciding to have a flick at Bob Carr, who had come here at the behest of the Labour Party. He was a bit of a rat bag as a, as a Premier of, of New South Wales, uh, was linked to a whole lot of corruption issues, but ultimately ended up working for the, the, uh, the federal government in a foreign affairs sort of arrangement. He came over here. Uh, at the behest of the Labour Party to speak to a closeted group of Labour Party people, made some outrageous statements about AUKUS, about how, you know, uh, by cozying up to these nuclear powers, we were putting our our, our um, 
foreign policy at risk, et cetera, even though we're not even signing up to the pillar one of AUKUS, and uh, basically said we'd have rocks in our head. And, and, of course, Winston flicked back and said, well, you know, we can't really listen to anything that Bob Carr says. He's a shill for the, for the uh, Chinese government. What are your thoughts on that? So, first and foremost, good at one level that Labour wanted to talk about AUKUS or power to them, although I was disappointed that it was really uh, very one-sided. Uh, not that I was at it, but when you've seen the reports and who was speaking, it was a very one-sided discussion, uh, which is very much anti-AUKUS. And look, there's reasons to be sceptical, worried about any AUKUS agreement. I'm laying my cards on the table. I'm in full support of New Zealand uh, signing up to Pillar 2. And as you've rightly pointed out, Cam, that's not the nuclear submarines. We don't want them. We don't need them. We couldn't afford them. Um, you know, we're proud of our anti-nuclear status. But Pillar 2 is around things like cyber security and other advanced technologies and it behoves us not just as a country uh, but as a if a, a network of countries to be ready so it's a good I think a good thing but I would have liked to see more debate and it's unfortunate that this is becoming quite I know this might sound stupid but it is becoming quite political and it seems almost just like a cheap reason for the opposition to oppose the government which is a bit sad when we're dealing with national security but well, then old it, yeah sorry yeah what's interesting though is that these discussions with AUKUS or involving ourselves in Pillar 2 of AUKUS was started by Ardern and Hipkins. And now all of a sudden, they're again it. It seems, as you say, a cheap political stunt. Um, and then to, to get um, you know what the Australian media or uh, people in politics uh, affectionately call Bob Carr, to get Beijing Bob over here to rail against it because um, it might affect our trade with China. You know, maybe Winston's onto something here. I mean, I know there's a, a an Australian Financial Review um, article from a few years back that outlined precisely how Bob Carr gets his money, what what he does, and the the vault face he had from when he was the foreign minister to his positions now, particularly on China. And you have to wonder whether or not uh, actually he is in fact a shill for the Chinese government. Yeah, well, he, he's certainly been – so he became the head of the Australia-China Relations Institute, gosh, 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. As, if people want to look it up, yeah, as you mentioned, Cam, there's a, quite a good write-up in the Australian Financial Review, which quotes the likes of Clive Hamilton and others, really um, well-respected uh, sinologists or people who, who study China. So, yeah, Bob it seems to be one of these people where they're given these sinecures, these uh, well-paying titular roles, um, and he's been very supportive of – of China. Now, like, again, it's a free world. He's 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 welcome to be, but we're also free to to draw attention to that. So yeah, he's been very positive about just about everything that China does and how Xi Jinping and others are misunderstood. But he's also been quite critical of um, Australia. Now, again, he's welcome to be, but we're mm. welcome to call that out. So yeah, he's he has been known repeatedly to be more pro-China. The not now. Would I have said it the way Winston did? No, but that's Winston, and he he, he knows how to grab a headline. He knows how to hit hard. But I, I thought it was also interesting that Bob Carr struck back with the lawsuit. It, it's sort of a classic playbook there to try and silence uh, someone. I don't think it'll work for him, as Winston himself has said. He's he's been around the the track a few times. He he knows how to handle these things. But there's there's good reason to raise questions about Bob Carr. Yeah, well, Just there, as, there are fin- questions about the New Zealanders too. Yeah, the Australian Financial Review headlines is how Bob Carr became China's pawn. <laughs> so they're fairly. Uh, I don't recall Bob Carr suing the Australian Financial Review, and there's certainly if you Google Bob Carr sue sues Australian Financial Review, and there's no evidence of anything ever happening. So. It, it bemuses me that he thinks that he can silence uh, Winston Peters but with the mere threat of a lawsuit. Again, it's a, it's a classic ploy. I mean, personally, again, I, I'm prejudiced for want of a better word. I mean, I have a particular view as is coming through about our relationship with China. But, you know, there's Paul Keating in Australia too. It was interesting when the foreign minister of China came over a few months ago that they had a private meeting uh, with uh, Paul Keating. Now, again, Paul's welcome to have his views are similar to De Bob's. Again, we have similar people here in New Zealand. You know, John Key, two New Years ago, wrote a very long puff piece, I would say, in support of China and what it's doing. 
again, they're all welcome to their view, but we're welcome to, if you will, expose that and speak to it. Yeah, and, and question why they've got these views and why they never said them when they were in, in Parliament or, mm. or whenever. So, you know, you're right. It's, we live in a free country. Well, still free. Still free. Uh, <laughs> where we can actually say these things. It's just interesting to see Bob Carr lawyer up and and try and threaten Winston Peters. It's, he'd, like, he'd like nothing better than for there to be a defamation lawsuit from between now and the election. It'd be, oh, it'd he, would. Just, he would just love it. And, and I'm pretty sure his lawyers will be salivating at, at discovery and, and looking at bank statements and things like that over over a period of years. It could be quite interesting. Again, I just think it's a, an intimidatory type tactic to lawyer up and threaten uh, lawsuits. To, it's, it's not that in itself is a sign. And then you have to ask who's, who's funding this or prepared to fund it. I wonder if they'll pull back at the last. Um, I mean, it's pretty hard to get defamation in this country. I'm no lawyer, but my general understanding is defaming someone or rather getting a... a or defaming a politicians. Defaming politicians or people involved in politics and, and in partisan politics as well. Winston will be saying, well, this is the rough and tumble of political debate. You came over here. You uh, interfered in New Zealand's foreign policy by making some outrageous statements. And I gave you, as the foreign minister, I gave you a flick back. That's about the extent of of what it is. It's a little bit of a a petty fight, um, which is kind of meaningless with a little few insults and barbs thrown in as well. But uh, yeah, it's always highly entertaining. But um, I'm actually glad to see Winston back because we've got some entertainment back in our news. Yeah, well, we need characters in, in Parliament, and he's certainly one of them. And I'm actually really pleased he's the foreign minister. I actually like a lot of what Winston uh, does and his approaches to things. And and look, he's well respected by a lot of our allies. So he's, regardless of people's political views or views of him, he actually is a really good foreign minister for us. Yeah. Now, just speaking of characters in Parliament, let's let's just segue into the Green Party, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? Well, you know, have they got a systemic problem inside the Green Party? You you have a look at the terrible issues that they've had. And, you know, the, the key ones are, of course, uh, Golrez Garriman and her uh, stealing, her five-finger discounts around the boutiques of Auckland uh, and Wellington. Then you've got uh, James Shaw quitting. And if you read between the lines, he's quitting in frustration. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you've got Julianne Genter, who not only was overbearing and rude in the, in the parliament, uh, but appears to have been overbearing, rude and possibly in one case assaulted somebody, pushing her point of view. Is there something wrong inside the Green Party? I think yes is the the short answer. Um, If I might, you've missed two others. There's Dana, and I'm sorry I forgot her last name, but she's Uh, still- Darlene Tanner. Darlene Tanner, apologies. Yes, Um, migrant exploitation. Yeah, exactly. Still um, on the MP's salary, but nowhere to be seen. And then, of course, Elizabeth Kedekedi, who had to leave last mm. parliament because of her comments around Chloe Swarbrick. So do they have a problem? Most definitely. And I, I think we can say that. It was, someone else pointed it to me the other day because I, I was saying no political party is innocent. You know, every political party's had its its problems and scandals. And I've certainly seen a number of my national MPs go for some pretty uh, disgusting activity, behavior, and so forth. So no party is innocent. But as it was pointed out to me, this is four, and if you include James, five Green MPs, a party that is so small, yet so many of its MPs are getting into to trouble. And so, yeah, they do have a, a cultural problem. Exactly what it is that's driving, I don't fully understand, although you could sort of speculate it's sort of a holier-than-thou attitude, and it's still there. Yeah, they're so and- smug and sanctimonious, aren't they? They're always telling everybody how that how we should live our lives, and then when they're revealed as being shabby little charlatans uh, for whatever reason, they get all indignant and say, "Oh well, you know, um, uh, we were passionate about the uh, about the discussion," which is which is the line that's being trotted out about Julianne Genter. Um, we had, oh no, um, poor Golrez Garman has suffered for being a refugee and a woman and a person of colour. Um, these are all just pathetic excuses uh, for poor behaviour. And if we look back at at poor behaviour of, say, national MPs, and a classic example in relation to the Julianne Genter situation is Tim Vandermolen. He was censured by the P- Privileges Committee unanimously. Mm. 
I doubt that we'll see a unanimous sanction of Julianne Genter at the Privileges Committee now that Jerry Brownlee sent it to the committee. Yeah, I, I hope they do, but I'm I'm unsure they will either. I mean, it's a very good contrast, you know, um, of behaviours. Tim was grilled day after day after day. Um, I mean, I mean, to carry my hand, I'm a friend of Tim's. It, it was a hard, a hard time but almost unrelenting coverage and focus. And he remained in the parliament, actually, whereas, yeah, with Julianne, to be fair, I think some of the media, dear old Mikey Sherman last night was actually beginning to put a little bit of heat on Julianne. Um, But, you know, here's an MP who's accused of multiple activities, including, you know, grabbing someone uh, and has now absconded off to the Chatham Islands. Uh, To be clear to your viewers or listeners, sorry, she's... The MP for there. In P for there, but it's an interesting coincidence. But yeah, it's too many excuses. And I think maybe that's what drives part of this cultural problem, Cam, is that they've always got an excuse for their behavior. Um, yeah. And actually, a lot of it's just not excusable or, you know, we're all under stress. We all have long, tiring weeks. Um, I don't tend to start yelling and screaming at people. And, you know, like you, I'm passionate about different topics, uh, mm. but I've never lost my rag on them or gone challenging an MP across the house. If you're raising your voice and, and remonstrating up close and personal, you've kind of lost the argument, in my view. Mm-hmm. And the video of it was very unbecoming. It's a little bit distant. It's hard to see, but um, she clearly is standing over the top of him, uh, very close, whilst there is a debate going on uh, about a particular bill. Mm. Uh, you know, the minister is sitting a- at the head of the table, uh, Simeon Brown, with one of the deputy speakers in the chair beside him. That, that, this is a committee stage that we're talking about here. Mm. Uh, and she's seen fit to rise from her own seat at the other end of the chamber, trot down there or storm down there, brandishing a rather thick uh, bunch of papers and remonstrate with another minister because of something he had equipped or, or said you know, in response to some of the debate speeches that was going on. It's quite bizarre behaviour. It is, but I've seen it before uh, mm. from her. Again, she, she does feel things passionately. And at one level, that's great. I think actually people being passionate, but actually it has to be done constructively. Uh, and so what she did was completely, totally inappropriate. And for those who have seen the video, you can see initially the shock actually on MPs' faces of across both sides of the house going, whoa, because there are constructive ways to do this. I mean, you, you, you give your speeches in Parliament from your seat. Yep. Um, you don't walk around, you don't go up to the face of another MP. But if I had wanted to, say, talk to Matt Ducey or she wanted to talk to him about something, she can send a note or actually you more, how would you put it, politely walk across and say, hey, look, have you got a moment uh, to step into the lobby to have a chat? Or as I used to do with you know, when Labour ministers, you go over to them, but again, not threatening. You go, oh, hi, um, Andrew or... Any, well, thinking of Andrew Little because of the foreign affairs and defence stuff. So, mm. can I just have a quick word? And he would. But what yeah. she did, completely, completely out of line. And you know, just do the thought experiment, Cam. If this was in reverse, yeah, had a national MP gone charging over, they wouldn't have lasted four hours before they were accused of uh, toxicity and abuse and bullying and violence. That'd be your career'd be toast, toast, totally. But again, I wonder if if this behaviour uh, of Julianne Genta and and you can look at at Chloe Swarbrook herself, um, you know, with her draping tea towels around her shoulder and and shouting horrendous slogans that basically intimate uh, she's in favour of genocide of Jews in in the Holy Land. There's a you know this activist element that's within the Green Party, and and it's got stronger and stronger, and you haven't got you know, find people like Jeanette Fitzsimons there, who was a totally reasonable person, passionate, but totally reasonable and, you know, inoffensive in, in every way. That was the old Green Party. We've now got this activist base where any tactic goes and the sanctimoniousness of them that they're right and everyone else is wrong and therefore you must listen to this opinion mm-hmm. leads them to have this arrogant, overbearing uh, demeanor, not just in Parliament, but also um, in their private life as well, when they're shopping or doing whatever. Yeah, it's sort of a, an entitlement that comes out of a zealotry. I mean, it's 
I'm trying to think of how to put it succinctly. I mean, you've actually put it exceptionally well yourself, but they, they, they seem very blind to their own behaviors while being so obsessed with uh, everybody else's. And, you know, the way that the Greens are conducting themselves uh, in these protests, the words they're choosing is quite ironic because the words they use uh, are seen by many people, Jewish or otherwise, as being calls for violence. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, the Greens are the first to say that if I use misused someone's pronouns, then I'm a terribly violent, angry person. You go, well, hold on a moment, hold on. Um, you know, look well, at Mary Mar- Davidson saying that well, um, crimes are mostly committed by cis white males. Oh, I know. You know, I mean, and and then every time you see uh, someone who's not that in Parliament, it's all over Twitter saying, "Oh, just another cis white male committing." Oh, wait, you yeah. know, um, that's the sort of blanket statements that they make about almost anything. And you know, the Darlene Tana one that was supposed to have been completed within two weeks. We, here we are, what six weeks later, complete and utter silence. Uh, you've got a, a Green Party MP. Uh, who I I nicknamed him El Woco Loco, um, uh, but you know Ricardo uh, Menendez March. He's always railing against exploitation of migrant workers, and there he is sitting right next to one who's actually been doing it. I think when you become so obsessed in this activist space with everybody else, you lose a view of yourself, and I think that's why you end up with that blindness or entitlement, as you say. Here's a party which, you know, rightly calls out migrant exploitation, yet one of their members uh, allegedly has been part of that. A party that says we don't like bullying or violence, uh, but, you know, rallied people to a violent protest in Albert Park. A party that says they stand for women, and yet that same protest in Albert Park was targeted on beating up a woman. I mean, it's just Mm. the absurdities drive us mad. And I think the best we can do is just continue to draw attention to it. Uh, But, you know, jumping back to the review and to to Darlene, I mean, I'd almost forgotten. I mean, but that's the whole point of the delay, isn't it? That that most most of us, and here's me, a former MP, forgot all about it until the Genta event. It was like, oh, my God, there's another one as well. (laughs) Yeah, I I actually do believe there is a a systemic problem inside the Green Party uh, with candidate selection with behaviour, when you've got basically a bunch of rowdy, shouty-type people who think they're 100% right on any issue that they they care to voice an opinion on, it's going to grate against everybody else. But they seem, I always say you know, facetiously that, that it's okay, they're the Green Party, they've got the uh, shield of sanctimony to hide behind. <laughs> well, you, you do see that. I mean, we've, we've touched on it briefly, but you do see that in the responses there's always lots of excuses put forward, but I would suggest just about any of them put forward, A, don't make sense of themselves, and B, apply to any MP, in fact, to any New Zealander. You know, oh, we're feeling grief-stricken. Oh, we're really under pressure. Well, that's most families, but most families, most individuals in those families are not running about. Look, we're um, all stressed, right? But I don't go um, to the nearest menswear shop and and uh, give myself a five finger discount for us for a pretty cool jacket or, or or anything. No one does that, right? Yeah. And here's the other thing: you don't do it just once. You do it again and again and again. I mean, she's charged with three um, stores uh, taking stuff. You may be assured that there will be others. Oh, it's the old where there's smoke, there's fire, and I, I suspect. I think we're up to now. Three people now have come out around Julianne Genta. Mm. Um, there's there's more to, to come. I mean, look, we'll see where the privileges complaint goes. Uh, we'll see what Julianne has to say when she returns in the chat. And I thought, you know, to be fair, I thought she spoke only briefly last night to TV One News, but it actually it was not bad. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a lot more that needs to be. As she climbed onto a, on, into a C-130 Hercules. That's right. <laughs> I would have thought she would have cycled there. I mean, she asked us to cycle to absurd places in our lives, so maybe we should have asked for her to cycle to the Chathams. I mean, it's absurd, of course, but, but you know, that's the hypocrisy of these people. Well, I'm actually fascinated why, and someone should probably be asking questions more out of curiosity, why it was a C-130, because obviously there's commercial flights. Mm. Uh, there, but you know, obviously a military plane's going. There's probably there'll be a good reason, I suspect, but it'll be interesting to know why and who else was going. 
But that's a that's a segue, if you will, or a separate issue to how she's behaved. But there's serious issues in the Green Party that have to be addressed. Well, maybe she's visiting her her um, voters, uh, all five of them. I note there was only five in the Chatham Islands that voted for Julianne Gibbs at the last really? election. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> they'll be able, they've probably still got a phone box they can have a meeting in. I I must admit I I have sadly never made it to Great Barrier or the Chathams. There's two, those are both places that Rachel and I want to visit. We've, have you been there yourself? So I'm switching into the interviewer all of a sudden. <laughs> no, no I, I haven't been to either of those. Uh, I, I th- These days, the only island I spend a bit of time on is Waikiki, but uh, there's a, a very pleasing distraction there at the moment. So. <laughs> Good. I think we better leave that there. <laughs> I think we've been, and you've got to go to to another call. So thanks for your time, Simon, and um, welcome back to the crunch. And no doubt we'll we'll talk again throughout the year. We'll do. Hey, Cam, great to have you back on here and the rest of the team. All right, thank you. Thanks, Simon. Simon is such a fascinating fellow to talk to. I really enjoy our discussions. But it's appalling that the Chinese government thinks that it's okay to spy on our MPs. He's not an MP now, but it's still pretty dire news to find out that the Chinese seem to think it's okay to spy on us. What do you reckon? Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.